behind me here I've got something that really could be quite interesting especially if I could get it to work I bought this in a non-functional state uh, but I think even if I can't get it working properly it might still be interesting just having a poke around inside and having a look at how it was supposed to work because this is the world's first talking alarm clock from 1971. So this is going back before the ages of your sort of digital electronics, things that could use voice synthesizer chips to read the time. I mean, you could get a cheap watch now, you press a button, it would speak to you. I got this little alarm clock the other year, which a digital alarm clock and a loudspeaker. 3.02 p.m. 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Cost very little, very cheap to make, no doubt. But back in 1971, it was a different proposition. They couldn't just stick a couple of chips in there to read things, they had to do things old school. And as far as I can tell, I think that these use magnetic discs with recordings on them to read out the time. Similar, in a way, to how when you'd ring up somewhere and you'd get the time over the telephone. There was various different technologies used for those, whether it was records or optical recordings, going all the way back to the 1930s. But bringing it into the home for the first time must have been quite a challenge, and I'll be interested to see how they went to about doing it. Um, now, whenever I've seen these things for sale, more often than not, they're sold in, in a state where it says the clock works fine, but it doesn't speak anymore. And there's so many of those that I've seen, I've got a feeling that maybe there's just a, like one particular fault that's affecting them all, something that perhaps is quite easy to fix, something that gets stuck. I don't know, we'll find out when we have a look at it. I am a little bit concerned though that it might not tell the right time because it's imported from the US, so therefore it's expecting a 60 hertz power supply. And in the UK, with my step down power transformers, I'll still only be providing it with a, a 50 hertz one, so it might run slow. But then again, it doesn't really matter too much for demonstration purposes. I say that's if I can demonstrate it, is a good chance that this thing is beyond repair. But it's nicely packaged at least, so we'll have a look inside and see if we could get it working. It's a bit of a museum piece this because I've not only got the original box but all the documentation that came in it as well as the clock there's the earpiece for the radio which is still in its packet and the remote control which is unused this is just a button that you click and it plugs into the side of the clock or into the back and it will speak the time when you press the button but just want to show you this on the box here Handle with care, use no hook. That's an old fashioned message. And then on this side here, I don't know if you can see this, it was sent from Panasonic to a company called Radio Equipment, 196 Vulcan Street, Buffalo, New York. That company is no longer there now, but they were around long enough to appear on the Google Street View. They showed up all the way up until the 2012 version. So sometime between 2012, 2015, they disappeared, but they had a good long run at it. But yeah, so that's the stuff from the box. Um, lovely old logos on here, but of course you're not really that interested in a box, maybe that's just me. Uh, let's move on. So we've got all the original documentation here, and I find stuff like this fascinating. It's a little window into history. For example, the Panasonic Service Center list for the US and Canada on the other side. And they've got abbreviations underneath these. And the one for the USA, well it's the Matsushita or Matsushita Electronic Corporation of America. That's abbreviated to MECA. And the Hawaiian one, well, that's meh. So, yeah, um, probably wouldn't use those nowadays. But this this is fascinating, this little um, brochure here. It's pretty much the entire Panasonic range, well, for the US anyway. So it goes all the way through various different things, televisions, radios, 8-track, uh, reel-to-reel, onto vacuum cleaners, mixers, all that kind of stuff and some great little pictures in here. Just want to show you one thing at the front here though, I might show you a couple more pictures as well, I might scan some in. So this little black and white television, the TR001, I believe this was the smallest television in the world at the time when it was introduced in 1971. But the reason I'm showing you this is because this particular television, the guts out of these models were used to create the Comlock communication devices used in the television show Space 1999. So they'd have the screen inside the prop Comlock device attached with a wire to the rest of the electronics and those will be hidden out of sight. The wire would travel up perhaps the person's arm or off camera somewhere. But yeah, the TR001 was the Comlock in Space 1999. 
And talking of TVs, the largest colour television you could buy from Panasonic at this time was this one, a 21 inch screen. But notice everything in here has a little name. I don't know if you spotted that, but let's just say we'll look at these televisions here. So these are black and white TVs. So they've got a model number, but they've also got a name. So that one is the Scottsdale. That one's the Marietta, the Morningside, the Terryville. And everything in here has got a silly name next to it, like Clock Radios, the Maywood, the New Day. Um, completely random names, really. Don't really seem to have much relevance to anything that the model does. I mean, this is a Darien record player, and that's the Cahill, and that's the Prescott. Um, but yeah, somebody must have had to go through every model of product that they made and think, what could we call this? I'll tell you what, we'll call this eight track player that has some speakers with it. We'll call that the Scarsdale. And this one, the Collingswood. I don't know how long they kept that idea up for, but there you go, a little bit of history there. And as well as that, we've got the registration card and the actual instructions for the device itself, which are nice to have. And they're really nicely done as well. It goes on about there have been many different kinds of clock radios before, but never anything like this. The engineers have developed a talking clock with a voice inside. Right, so, and it all falls out into this really quite nice brochure. There's someone using the remote control, which is known as the touch and call remote switch for time announcing. You can hear the time from a distance. I think she just needed to look to her right there. She better see it, but still. And then over here, there's somebody with an optional pillow speaker for listening to the radio. But it says you can also use the uh, supplied earphone. So yeah, don't put it on top of your telly like that. Don't put it on top of a book. Don't put a book on top of it. And... Um, that looks like don't use it in a kitchen, perhaps. Maybe it doesn't like um, humid environments, but there you go. So all this is all great, and you're probably thinking, why am I taking so long to talk about all this kind of stuff? And the reason is it doesn't really work properly. So let's just see what it does do at the moment. Okay, the first thing you've probably noticed is that it's a little bit dark on the front, and I do have it switched on at the moment, but on the top here, you can see we've got the illuminated button that says touch and call. And I have noticed a, a light down the side here, but maybe that's just uh, bleeding through from the top. But yeah, it is rather dark. Let me press the button and we'll hear what it sounds like. Now you can't hear anything there at all, neither can I. Well, I can hear something moving inside. It's definitely not speaking the time though. But what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put my microphone up to it and then you'll better hear what that sounds like. But let's put the lights back up. Right, so I'll put my lavalier on the top here and just have a listen to this. Yeah, there's definitely something going on in there. Now, as far as the other functions go, other than speaking the time, the radio works. This switch here is a little bit tough to turn, but I'll turn it on. Oh, congratulations, Jacob. Yes, of course you can have cake. Oh no, there it is. It's one big pile on the floor. Here we've got a switch which is labelled hour call, so that would announce the time every hour on the hour if that's depressed. And along the bottom here, volume, tone, FM or AM, and tuning for the radio. Around the back, oh, on the side here, notice that it says English. Well, the H is peeled off, but that's to show that this is an English version, so they'll have sold this in different countries with different languages built into it. Right on the back here, that's to set the time. We've got the sockets for the external remote control or the earphone slash speaker. That's to adjust the volume of the announcements. That's to attach up to an internal FM antenna and that's if you wanted to attach an external one. So that's the single speaker. And then again, those sockets from the back are repeated on the side here, just for convenience sake. Now I've noticed I can get this thing to speak. Initially, nothing was working at all. Then I pressed this button loads of times, started to hear that mechanism going inside. So it must've been really gunged up, but still nothing was coming out of the speaker. And then I noticed if I press the button whilst the radio is on, the audio comes through on the speaker. Very quiet, but you should be able to just about hear it. So let's try that now. Right, so we've got two things going on there. First, I've untuned the radio, so we're just listening to static and therefore not worrying about content matches. 
But then the speech comes in, it's very muffled, but also there's a regular click on it. Now the click is nothing to do with the mechanism inside here, it's just picking up electrical interference from other devices in this room. But let's just have another listen to it. So what's this time going to be now? It's going to be um, 4.41 perhaps. So let's just see if it sounds like 4.41. To me, that sounded like it was saying 3.40. Five o'clock. That was pretty clear. Five o'clock. Of course, it's six o'clock, but still, we're not going to split hairs. Now, I'll just mention a couple of things. There should be a Panasonic badge there that's fallen off. I've seen quite a few of them for sale with the badge that fell off, so that seems to be a common thing. But the main issue is that, as I suspected at the beginning, this is not going to tell the right time in the UK. It's basing its time on the electricity frequency. So it's designed for use in the US. Using it in the UK on 50 hertz means that it runs slow. Yeah, so you can see the sweep second hand here. A minute on this takes quite a bit longer than a minute to happen, which means that it's always falling behind. Now, there's a slim possibility that inside here, there's a switch to change the gears to choose between 50 or 60 hertz. You might remember a tape recorder I featured a while ago with a flip clock in it. That had a lever in it to switch between 50 and 60 hertz. But we'll see when we get inside it. I need to open this thing up now, but the first job is to unplug it. Yeah, I'm not too sure how it comes apart. I think this rear section might come off. I don't know how much access that's going to give us. We've got four screws in here and looking at those screws, it definitely seems like someone's been in here before. They're a little bit stripped. And then underneath on the base, there's another set of screws. And more likely than not, we're going to have to take those out and those out and perhaps the whole inside will slide out. But uh, I think we'll start off at the back. We'll take these four off and see where we get with that. Oh, there we go. We're in. OK, so I'm quite happy with the axis I've got here. We've got our magnetic disc there. We've got the little playback head there, a little tape head. So that's going to be popping down on the disc at the right point. The disc looks a little bit damaged there. He has a, there's a break in it. It's torn at that point, which is a shame. Let's turn it on and see if we can get it to revolve. Five, okay. Five, okay. To cut down this clicky, I'm just going to put a metal shield underneath this and see if that helps. You know you hear about all those people wearing tinfoil hats to block out alien transmissions. I'm wondering if they're onto anything. I'm going to put some tin foil on top of that, well underneath there, and see if that cuts out the clicking. Let's have a listen. Five, oh five. It seems that the tinfoil hat wearers are actually onto something. Let's just have a look how the time's set on this. OK, so on the back here, I've got the wheel to set the time. So if I push this in and turn it, we can see that that's actually turning the disc. OK, now I don't know if you can see this, but there's these tracks here. We'll start on that one there. It runs all the way from the centre and goes out like a crescent shape to the outside here. So this is what the head is going along when it's playing the audio. Now the trouble is with that, it would have to have 720 tracks to have one for each minute of the day because of course it's going to repeat them for AM and PM. It's not got a separate one for each of those. So I don't think that would fit 720 tracks on. Now I've just realised there are two discs here where this metal arm's pushing down, that's where they join. So this section's the outer disc, which is reading off the minutes. And then the inner disc is the one for the hours. And as I set the time, you might be able to see them revolve at different speeds. Let's just spin that round now. So there you go, you can see the centre one just about. It's hard to show on camera. Perhaps a bit easier to see from this angle. There you go. So that's the outer disc, which is a bit torn up in places. And the very centre part, that's going to read the hours off. I managed to remove this bar from the back. It gives us a bit of a better view of the mechanism inside. So let's just press it again. Nine, 
18, 9, 19, 10, 31. What you're looking at here is the back of the clock mechanism. And if you look at that sticker, you'll see on the top right of it, it says 60 hertz. So this mechanism is solely designed to be used in a 60 hertz zone and therefore will never keep the right time in the UK. Now, while I've got it apart, we've done pretty much everything we can with it. I'll see if taking the screws out of the base enables me to get the whole chassis out of the inside of the case so we can have a look at the bottom of it. Right, that's all the screws out, so let's see if this thing comes apart. Yep, yeah, that's loose now. Right, so that should now slide out with any luck. Okay, so we're getting to look at the uninteresting side of the circuit board here. To get to the other side, I'd need to unstring the radio tuner, take out some screws here. But when we get there, all we would see if I was to do it would be a, a radio tuner for AM and FM, as well as a kind of circuit board similar to what you get in a cassette player. I'm just going to turn the lights off to see exactly what's illuminated on this dial. Right, so the lights coming from behind it, these are illuminous hands. No doubt if I get my Geiger counter out, it'll probably tell me I shouldn't be going near those. Let's just see where that bulb is on the inside though. Well, there's the backlight for the tuning dial. It's really sandwiched all the way in the middle of there. Not that easy to get to, I'd imagine, if that blows. You'd have to take all that circuit board out from beneath it. Let's see if we can get a bit of an angle to have a look at what's on that circuit board, though. So there you go, that's what you're missing. Basically, it looks like the inside of any typical transistor radio cassette player from the early 1970s. Now, once the case is put together, these five pads on the front of the device push up against these five connectors on the inside front of the case, which in turn lead off to wires, which then go off to the earphone and remote control devices. Since those aren't present at the moment, it seems like the audio is deactivated, but still we could get a bit of a better look at the motor mechanism whilst the case is off. Do you recall earlier on when I mentioned that the wear to the screws on the back made it look like someone had already been in this case before? Well, one of the repairs appears to have been to the magnetic disc. It looks like some splicing tape has been applied to repair a tear in the disc. And back in the days when electrical repair places were common, this is definitely a piece of equipment you'd try to get fixed given how much it originally cost to buy. When it was launched in the US, the retail price was approximately $130. Now, accounting for inflation, that's worth around $850 nowadays. That's a lot to pay for a radio alarm clock. So if it did start playing up out of warranty, it's definitely something you'd try to get fixed rather than just chucking it in the bin. So there you go, that's the Panasonic RC6900. A little bit the worse for wear now, but at least we were able to get it semi-functional so we could see how it was supposed to work. And I'm always fascinated by devices like this, electromechanical technology that's performing a function that really would be a lot easier with integrated circuits, but it predated it by quite a few years. This first came out in 1971 so we're looking at a, a 50 year old talking clock so you know you got to give it a little bit of leeway it's not going to be perfect after all these years there are some other things in this video that are now 50 years old as well and they're not quite functioning as they once did but anyway that's it for the moment as always thanks for watching I'm taking the unusual steps of adding an addendum onto this video, and I'll explain why. 
I tend to put my videos out a week or so early on Patreon. It enables me to get some feedback on them, see if there's things I need to add to them or change, things that I didn't explain very well or things that I glossed over. Well, in this case, I got a couple of people asking the same question, which usually means that that question's then going to get asked a hundred times or so on YouTube once the thing goes live. So it's best to address it now. And that question was, did I try cleaning the tape head? And did I try cleaning the magnetic disc? And the answer to both those things is yes, although I cut all that footage out of the video because it didn't make any difference to the sound quality. You can rest assured though that if you ever see one of my videos and there's a magnetic tape head in it, I have cleaned it at some point with isopropyl alcohol, even if it isn't necessarily shown on screen. There's a lot of things that don't get shown. I mean, I've probably got like eight hours worth of video for this one, but a lot of it is things not happening. And overall, the reason that this thing doesn't sound so good is because it's just plain knackered. That disc's all crumpled up. There's parts of it where the sound's just faded away entirely. I don't know how, but it's somehow got demagnetized or whatever over the years and there's no sound on certain parts. Then other parts, it doesn't line up properly. The head travels between two tracks and it mumbles, whatever it's supposed to say. Uh, really, it is pretty worn out, but it wasn't about the device as it stands now. This video was more about the ingenuity of Panasonic and how 50 years ago they managed to manufacture a talking radio alarm clock for the first time in the days before they could use voice synthesizer chips and how they went about doing that. And I thought that was fascinating. So yeah, don't worry too much about the fact that my machine is completely knackered. That's just how it is now. We're really thinking more about the 1971 side of things. And I hope you enjoyed having a look inside this one. Even if it wasn't functioning perfectly, I still thought it was a fascinating thing to show. Anyway, that really is it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching. Nine, 20.